Uh, I want to talk about VPM workflow today and um, I wanted to start with a short story actually which was one of the first projects I ever did in my professional career um, which was at, at a telecommunication company and they had something I think every company has so there were applications coming into um, the company at some point and they um, had an application processing um, thing which they built and that was actually the team where I was part of there at that time and at some point in that application processing you have to enter the customer or the opportunity into some CRM system. I think that's very easy to, uh, to, um, to imagine I think so and what happened there as well is that the CRM at some point in time it, it, it made trouble it basically broke down not completely but we had some trouble when we inserted data in the CRM system but we actually didn't recognize that. So um, we, we, we thought everything was happy, uh, but it wasn't. When does these things always happen? First, leap years. Leap years are good things, but it was on a Friday. It was Friday afternoon. So we went basically out of the office very happy, went uh, swimming or whatever, and we came back on Monday. And what happened on Monday was that the CRM system, the orders which were in the CRM system, basically fed some um, sales report. And the sales report basically was aggregated and goes to the C CFO of the company. And he basically saw on, this, uh, on that report, oh, our DSL, it was DSL fixed line thing, um, sales over the weekend goes down, went down to zero, really to zero. They had like a couple of thousand orders every day normally, so it was zero. So that's a huge thing. So he basically approached the CEO, he approached the CTO, he approached a couple of other managers in the line. And after some, some time, they really queued up all of them in our office. So it was my colleague called that the head of party. It was a great opportunity to meet the CEO, but it was a, quite not a nice experience, right? Because they walk in and say, oh, you have a problem there. And we said, no, no, everything is running fine. We don't believe that, show us that. And that's something I call later on um, alarming by management attention, which I think it's a clear anti-pattern. So you should not wait until the, like this head of party comes to your office and say, oh, well, you have a problem. It could be even worse. I see that all the time. I have a good example from yesterday. Yesterday I arrived in Ede um, in the hotel. I went in there and said, I have a reservation. He said, oh, I don't think so. There are no rooms left. There are no reservations open. I said, wait a minute. I have a booking com reservation number. Here it is. He typed it in. He said, oh, yeah, I find that. That's interesting. And he looked a bit more and she said, oh, yeah, you're on hold. What the fuck is on hold? <laughs> Uh, after some time, he somehow said, oh yeah, but we have rooms left. I said, what? wait a minute, you told me, well, whatever. But that's something I call alarming by customers, which is even worse. I mean, that was internally, if it's an external, it's even worse. And that's something um, which is completely different if you use workflow, if you use BPM technology. So for example, I think a lot of people in the room know BPM from what I asked earlier. So that's a BPM end process, for example. It starts at the beginning, that it does some stuff in a sub process. Then, for example, if you call the CRM system, that's a clear task within that BPM end process. It's visible there. Um, it's a so called service task. And then it goes on. If that service task fails, what you can do is um, you can go to your monitoring, for example, for Kamuna, that's the Kamuna cockpit, and you see that nice little thing where, you say, where it shows the incidents. Okay, there's one incident. Incident means there's something wrong with the process. Um, you can query everything which is shown in the cockpit, and that's um, something very interesting for the Kamunda philosophy. Um, so you don't have to use that tool if you don't want to, or if you have different use cases, you can just use the REST API to query the same information. So what we do very regularly is we just query that thing and put it into some uh, monitoring tool like in Singa or Nimbus or Nagios or whatever it is. Just query by REST API. It's one call where you say, give me the count of incidents. It's a very easy call. You can always do that. And then you have an alarming setup in like five minutes, right? And then you just get the alarm, oh, there are incidents queuing up, or what we always do um, also is like the number of open process instances, if that goes up to some extent, it's always um, also a bit um, at least strange, so you want to look at that proactively. Don't wait for the, for the head of party to arrive at your office, do that proactively. 
If you move on with that incident, you see in cockpit, for example, you see the whole process instance with the whole context. So you see where you are, you see the, um, the exact incident, the timestamp, um, the, uh, uh, the stack trace, for example, if you're interested in it. You see all the um, um, variables, like the data you have in the process. So you see a lot of information you need in order to figure out what the problem is. Um, so that's a great thing. So that's why we, why we um, um, can only motivate to use workflow. And that's what we did there, actually. Um, what you can also do, if you have that incident, you can do something um, like retrying, right? Because the process instance um, is waiting there. That's what a workflow engine is doing. It's a state machine. It can wait. That's a great thing. And it stores the state to the database. It waits there. And what you can do is you can do a retry. You say, try it again. It might be, in this case, what I, what I mentioned there, with network unavailable might be a temporary error. So you just click on retry, and it does it again. Um, you don't have to click yourself, so you have an ad additional features as well, like automatic retrying. So if you model the process, um, you can also specify something we call the retry time cycle, and that's an ISO format, which BPMN basically defines um, to use. So that means retry 10 times in a um, duration of period time, 50 minutes. So you just add it there, and then it will retry it automatically, and only if that doesn't succeed, at the end you get an incident. Because then a human has to look at it. So that's a lot about um, um, monitoring. Um, what you see very often, okay, if it's not a network error, in this case it was not a network error, it was a problem in the CRM system. So the error will not go away with retrying. Um, what you can do as well is you can pause the system for that service task. So you can say, oh, there's calling the CRM system is one step in my BPMN process. I want to exactly pause that one. So all the process instances are moving on. They're flowing in the system, but they're stopped there and they're queuing up. They're piling up. And you can even um, use one instance at a time to resume it and to see if that moves on or not, if the problem is fixed or not. And if the problem is fixed, you're just flooding the system again. Um, so that's a great thing to do. Um, but it didn't help, right? You pause it, now you have to resolve the problem. And in that company, and I recognize that in a couple of other companies as well, um, if it's a big company, you have different departments. So for example, if you go to the CRM guys, um, they might not like you that much. In that case, it was a remote location and there was a constant fight between the two locations who have the better approaches, the better technology and all these things. So they basically said, we don't have a problem. If you can, cannot do your call correctly, it's not our problem. And what we did, um, oh yeah, I call that hot potato issue handling. So, so that's a clear anti-pattern as well. Um, so what we did there is um, we stored the, um, the exact request we sent over the wire as a process variable. So we stored that in the, in the workflow engine. Um, so we know exactly the, the, the time with the millisecond. We know the SOAP request in that, in that case. We know the exact response or the fault. So we been, can basically prove, okay, we send that request at that time. It must be your problem. It's a bit sad that it comes to that, but the cool thing is you really have all this information available. So you can do a lot of things um, I'm, I'm doing, doing that. So um, from an operating and monitoring perspective, workflow is completely great. Um, I have a second story, same customer, different application actually, when they um, wanted to uh, have new applications, but not electronically, but on paper. Yeah, you know paper, this old thing which you put in the post and then they get it and they scan it and they put it in the same application processing process. Um, what they came up with is basically they had a bunch of uh, services, like they have the scan software, the OCR thing, um, doing the um, um, recognition, then they have the CIM and whatever. And basically the process looked a bit like that. And I see that actually very often. I call it, I don't have a better name yet. If you have any proposal, let me know. I call it the database of pain, which is kind of a central database where you store all the order state. So you say, oh, there's a new application. I scan it. I stored there, and then I have a state ID like um, 10. 10 means it's currently scanned. 15 means it's now scanned, it needs OCR. 
27 means it has OCR need to be stored and whatever. So they even have a note department managing these state IDs. And I think a lot of people are doing that and then you have like triggers or Perl scripts or Java or whatever always querying the database and that's just something you shouldn't do. Uh, so we came up with um, workflow, sorry, um, with the workflow. And then it looks a bit like that. You already know BPMN from earlier on. So you might scan the document, it gets to a drop folder. Then you have a scanning software. And that was the first approach they took. It basically picks it up from the drop folder, does some OCR. Um, then you might have some OCR problems. So you do some post editing. And you classify what it is, and if it's maybe an address change formula, you, you send it to SAP. These projects, we always have somebody saying, let's do it completely in SAP. Always. It's always the case. And the other folks, that's also interesting, they say, hey, we have this nice little scan software. It can do workflow, and that's true. Most of them can do that. They do the OCR, they do post-editing, so that's a human task. That's a wait state, so they have some kind of workflow built in. And a lot of people tend to use that and say, hey, we have that workflow solution. Why adding another workflow engine to the game? We can use that. And I like the example um, from Australia Post. Australia Post is also a customer um, from us. And what they start to offer is really digital um, documents management. So if you think what you currently are doing, it, it's kind of crazy that you get a truck full of paper, delivering letters to your office, you take all the letters, you scan it and throw it away. So it makes completely sense that maybe the post company already scans it. There are a lot of legal things to clarify there, but I'm pretty sure it will get to that because it doesn't make sense to, to carry all the letters to your office. And if you change that, the scan software is gone. You don't need that anymore. So it's kind of a problem if you buried the whole process in the scan software. And the same goes for SAP or other things. So um, the point what I'm making is that um, you should think about a dedicated workflow layer. Even if you can do workflow in other systems, um, you should have that dedicated workflow layer which just cares about the real business process. And that might trigger the OCR, but it might not if you don't need it anymore tomorrow. So that's a good um, example why you should have that layer. And you should do it actually in BPM. So why um, BPMN um, really matters, if you look at it from also a developer perspective, you have a lot of features in there um, which are really great. So um, um, you can distribute work, that's one thing, we see that in a minute. Um, so to users, human task management, or to services, the service orchestration or straight through processing. Um, you can handle events. Uh, we just make that joke at the beginning, like rea being reactive, react on events. That's something BPMN has built in. You can always say, um, if this uh, event arrives, I will do something. Um, you can correlate that to process instances. You can do asynchronous processing. You have the timer, this small little timer there means I really wait for some time or I wait until a message arrives, but if it's not there in time, I do something else. So there are a lot of concepts which are really hard to program yourself. Um, and of course, you have that nice little um, images, um, not only, by the way, for, for drawing the stuff or for developing the stuff, but also during operations. So that's an example. I maybe show that later also live, um, which is the heat map. Um, that's, by the way, is our own lead qualification process. So if you want to buy Kamunda Enterprise subscription, um, you will um, start at the very front and then hopefully go through till the end. But there might be some exits. Um, I don't want to wanted to go into details here now, but I think it's very, very, very good example where you can really see that all the history data you have in the engine can really be used um, to, to gather new information. So um, that's basically what we are there. So our mission as Camunda, we want basically that you have um, yeah, better processes, which is not completely true. So the real mission is that um, we want to improve process agility. So for, for me, it's not important that you have the best process in the world, but for me it's important that you have this dedicated workflow layer, that you have a process in place and then that this is easy to change and to adjust um, to new environments because we're facing a lot of change out there, new technologies, new um, um, uh, uh, challenges, new um, competition and so on. 
And as Kamuna, we basically provide methods and tools. So we have that nice book. Um, I have actually, I have two editions here. So if you have a good question up your sleeve later on, I can um, throw them around. Um, and we have a tool. So um, who am I? I'm Ben Drücker. I'm one of the founders from Kamuna. Um, yeah, I'm doing basically workflow all my life. So, so during studies, I already started with uh, JBPM. I committed to a couple of open source engines over time. And Kamunda, we are an open source BPM and we're based in Berlin, in Germany. Um, we're rather small. We're 60 people by now, more or less. And we are not venture capital uh, um, finance, which might be interesting for the one or the other. So we are growing organically. And yeah, that's what we do. We do process automation with the OMG standards. We will see that in a minute in a live demo. So we have BPMN. We already talked about that for workflow automation. CMMN, I will show an example later on for case management. And DMN for decision automation. We will see that in the demo as well. So that's what you can expect. What we have is an engine. So there's the core engine somewhere in the middle. It's a Java library. So in its core, it's a small Java library. It might be, don't remember exactly, two or three megabytes. Um, it's a main dependency, if you like. Um, you can bundle that within your own application. So you can ship it within your own VAR. Then you just access it via Java API. Or you can also run it on a, on a container like Tomcat or, or Whitefly or WebSphere or WebLogic. So we basically support all of them. Um, so that's pretty flexible in what you, what you do there. Um, we need a relational database for persistence. And we also have a REST API. So everything you can do in Java, you can also do via REST. And then we have a couple of applications around, like the task list for the end user, where you can see all the tasks. We see that in the um, live demo in a minute. Um, cockpit for operating, the modeler for modeling all these graphical models. And what a lot of customers are doing is actually here, um, they're building own um, end user applications. So if you want to do your own task list, your own application, that's pretty normal, actually. So you can use the Java, the REST API for that. So that's Kamuna in a, in a nutshell. Um, let me check the timing. I'm pretty good in the time. Great. Um, yeah, and what we are kind of proud, actually, is uh, we're, we're pretty good. So we're pretty fast as well. Um, we did a lot of performance of improvements over the last years. And we still are working on performance improvements, like, like really like leaps in performance, which I will talk about later on. Um, but we are also pretty good especially compared to other um, open source engines. We're not so much um, known here, um, but for what it's worth. So my plan was to jump in the demo as early as possible, which I think is pretty fair by now. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. We can do questions in the middle as well. If, they, if we get too much for the timing, I, I let you know. So um, what I will do, um, I basically um, switch to my Eclipse. I have created a small MAME project in, in advance. So that's just a normal MAME project. I added a, a dependency to the um, Kamunda engine, but that's not that um, complicated. Um, I have a BPMN process as part of my resources. So let's look at that. If I double click it, I, it opens up in the Kamunda modeler. The Kamunda modeler, it's a desktop tool. You can just download it on the Kamunda website. Um, it can model BPMN, obviously. Um, it's based on web technology. That might be interesting. So you can also use that modeler you see here, um, for example, in the web. So we also, um, uh, we also have a web version of that. We're currently working on a cloud uh, offering, having that um, available. So that's pretty flexible to use. I mean, you can start modeling. So let's do a very easy process because we don't have that much time. So let's assume you want to have, uh, I always do insurance examples because I'm working for a lot of insurance companies at the moment. So um, let's say you want to have a new car insurance. So that's, um, we let, I leave the typos in there to save some time. So um, it might be that the first thing you have to do is you approve the um, application. So approving the application might be a human task, so that should be in the task list. And then you might have two uh, possibilities, so either approved um, or not. So if it's not approved, so approved no, 
then it's rejected. And for simplicity, I don't do anything there. I should maybe inform the customer, it would be nice, but don't do that at the moment. Um, I do a second thing where I say, okay, um, if it's approved, it might, um, uh, let's say, create policy. So we want to create a policy for the customer because it's approved. So far, I think it's um, pretty easy. And then we have application, um, oh no, policy created. So, so far, I think very easy, just drawing. Now, the interesting part is how do I get that um, running? And I have to add a couple of things. First of all, I can add user interface, for example, for the user task, or to start a new process, I can add user interface. There are different possibilities. I could add an HTML form, so really an HTML snippet, maybe with JavaScript in it to have some interactive stuff. But the easiest thing is something like um, just defining some fields, which will be stored as plain um, and variables later on. So I could say, okay, in order to have car insurance, you have to specify the car. You just add a string there. I mean, that's, um, and your age, which is, um, let's say, uh, long, yeah. Um, so that's the age and that's the car. So I can hand in this data um, when I start the process instance. And we use that form fields a lot for rapid prototyping, actually. So um, a lot of business folks, when you discuss processes, models are very abstract, but clickable prototypes are really great. So um, this is something you can use to, to, to really to, to get going very fast. Um, in production, um, most of the processes use much more complex forms, but whatever. So um, let's start with that. Um, if I approve it, I basically do the, the same thing. So I want to have uh, let's say three forms where I say, okay, the first thing is, um, again, I want to display the car. So I have to retime that. Uh, I, the H. And I want to say if this is approved or not. So it's called approved. It's Boolean. Uh, add a label. So I can say approve yes or no. And that basically um, results in a process variable. Our process variables are a map. So you can store whatever you want in them at any time. So I can, um, I, afterwards I will have that process variable approved. I can add an expression where I say, okay. So if it's uh, not approved, I go this way. And this is, by the way, this is um, Java unified expression language. So that's nothing very special for us. If you know Java, it's pretty common in the Java world. So you can um, not only use plain variables, but, but you could also refer to objects or to beans like spring beans or CDI beans or whatever, whatever you have there and use that dot notation and um, do much more complicated expressions as well. But for the moment, um, that will perfectly do. So if it's approved there, if not this. Um, for the service task, you have a couple of options. So the um, easiest options is actually um, to attach a Java class to the service task in order to um, get it executed. So as soon as a process instance moves through that service task, it will, be, um, it will execute um, the Java class. And let's quickly write one. So I create a um, new class, um, name it create policy adapter and it implements an interface from us, so it says Java delegate. Um, there's an execute met method, which is called when the process instance run through. Um, there's an execution, it's called, I normally call that context, which is a bit more easy to get. So from the context, I can get stuff like, um, for example, the car, um, the variables I stored earlier, I can set new variables, and then I can do whatever you want to do so you could call a real service in the background. So for example, if we are calling SOAP services very often, um, we just create a um, wire um, Jux, uh, um, a Jux WS, um, just a client and call that client here. We have a web service connector where you can wire everything within the BPMN, but in the reality, it's much, much easier to do it in, in, in the Java code. So that's how it normally looks like calling service and then might do some output mapping and storing variables and these kind of things. Um, I just do a system out print line if you don't mind. So um, we make some noise to see it. Um, car 
and then um, I haven't stored that yet. Let's do that. So that's my car. Uh, car, car, and I also can um, get some information about the process instance, so I could have something like what's the current activity I'm um, running through, for example, and I just print that, and then I take that Java class and attach it to the bpmn process. And that should be it, actually. So I have a bpmn process. It's perfectly fine. It should actually run on the common engine. Um, what I can do, um, I can now build the main product, which I, by the way, just start via AND because I can double click in Eclipse very easy. But it's a normal main build. And then afterwards, it copy my WAR file um, to my local Wildfly. I have a Wildfly running here, but what I, what I said earlier, it could be a Tomcat as well or WebSphere. And then it, it's basically deployed. So I can see, ah, oh, there's a deployment going on, there's a process, um, which is the JFall process, seems to be deployed. And that's kind of a, a magic we have, what I said earlier. Um, we can run the engine also as what we call the container managed engine. So it's part, run as part of the um, Wildfly already. It starts up once with Wildfly. And then I just deploy a normal WAR file and add bpmn processes to it. And then it gets picked up and the container says, oh, yeah, you have a bpmn file into, um, in your deployment. So I deploy it on the, on the engine in the background. And that's a very easy model to get started, actually, because then you don't have to configure the engine anyhow in your, in your own deployment. Mm. So what I can do now is I can use the Kamuna tools. I, for example, I can go to um, cockpit. I have to sign in, that makes sense. Um, I see that there are process definitions deployed. So for example, my JFall process is deployed. So that looks exactly like it should. It has all the typos, so it's not prepared. Um, and I can run instances of that. So I can switch the um, um, application to the Kamunda task list. So I can say something like um, start the process, for example, in JFall at the car, that's a Porsche. I come back to that Y, 25 years old. That's it, I get the task, I receive application, I see the form, um, you see um, even the diagram where I am in the process and so on and so on. So that's actually very easy to do. Um, the next thing I wanna do, I wanna add some DMN to that. So um, you could think of um, like a rule set where you say, I wanna um, check the risk basically or determine risk, maybe that's better, um, which is a so-called decision, uh, a business rule task. So I wanna hook in a decision table where I determine the risk of that. So it might be that um, I don't need a manual approval so I can do something like manual approval or required yes or no. If no, uh, if yes, I do it. And then I do that. We do a bit of relay outing there. So pretty quick and it might be not the case. So, and the determined risk, it's a DMN table. Hang on a second. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, like a DMN table. Determine risk, we are advanced. So. Um, there I have a decision table where I have some inputs and some outputs. So I can say, for example, the input is the car and also the age. That's the two variables I have. If you call it from a BPMN process, you will have all the variables available automatically. Um, you can also call DMN tables via an own API. Then you just hand in the variables and they're evaluated here and you get a result. And the output could be um, that the um, manual approval required. So that's, uh, uh, now I have to do some boilerplate stuff. The H was a long, um, the car is a string. And there is a difference between the human readable thing and the machine readable thing. So I have to provide that. And I just call that approval required. And then I can add rules. So all the, um, uh, all the rows are different rules. So I could say, and that's why I'm using a Porsche here. Um, if you wanna have a Porsche 911 and you're younger than 30, um, that needs some additional approval. 
or it could say if you're under 21 that always needs some additional approval. Um, so you can very easily express rules here. And the MN is pretty powerful. So what you can do as well is um, that small U in the corner here that means um, um, unique, which is the so-called hit policy. So that means only one row in that table could fit. So if you have multiple rows um, applying, that's an error. So in my case, that unique is not, not a good idea actually to do because if I'm 20 and apply for a Porsche, both of the rules will actually be true. So unique is not correct, but I could change that either um, to collect all the risks, for example, then I get a list of results, or what I do is I, I do first, that means the first rule that matches will determine the result. And then I can do like a default branch if none of them matches, um, no manual, manual approval is required. And what you can do as well, you can have multiple outputs, so you could also do something like um, you have an approver, um, determined by the rule set. So I call him approver and that could be whatever, um, could be Mike or Ian, and or depending on, on what we have. So we have to actually to store that in the right location in my development project, right next to the BPMN process. Um, I call that risk for simplicity. And uh, now I can link that. So I have a business rule task. I can say, okay, this is implemented by DMN. You could also use um, um, Java code, for example, if you already have a rule engine in place or some business rule management system, and then you can just call that, or you say it's DMN, so it's Kamunda, and then you just um, use that ID in order to talk to that. Um, there are a couple of more things here. And I say I have a result variable, which is basically, I call that risk for simplicity. And again, it could be, a whole list of results. If I have that collect, I might get a list of results, but I know it's only one, so I say it's, it's a single entry. So that's what I do here. And now I have a new process variable, which I can use to make that decision. And since I had more than one um, output columns, it's a map of, of values, basically. So I can say, okay, um, manual approval required, it's an expression, I have to go that path if the risk, and now it's a map, and the key is, uh, forgot, sorry, <laughs> approval required. Um, so if that is required, I go that path, if that's not required, I go the other path, basically. And Another nice thing is at a lot of places within the process, you can use that expression language. So for example, for that user task, I might want to assign that to, to the right user because I determined that in the DMN table. So I can use expression language as well and I just use the um, approver. So that should actually um, work. Let's maybe, uh, we can maybe skip the relay outing, but somehow it's um, kind of, Nicer, so let's do that. Um, so that process should also work. Let's check that. So I deployed. Um, it gets picked up. Um, what you can already see here, it um, created a new version because I changed the BPMN file. It's a new version, we keep the old version. So if I go to cockpit, um, I can see um, the running process instance we started earlier. So that was close to five o'clock. So we started that one. It's still in the approved application user task. And you can see that it still is in the old process model, right? So it's the version one. We just deployed a new version two, which is a different process model. What we can do um, also in cockpit is um, we could now migrate that. So um, that's the default. We always keep running in the old version, um, but you can migrate that. So I could um, migrate my process instance. Hang on a second, what happens here? Ah, that's trick, right? If you're in Windows, if you, if you mark something in the console, it stops the server, so it doesn't give any response. <laughs> so now it's working. Um, so we can migrate that to the newest version. So um, we directly check if the task is still there. So in this case, we see, ah, this approved application is still there. So we um, basically move it to that um, right location. And then we can just do all the migration. Um, you can do that in a batch. So you could even run that on like a million of process instances. 
and then this is done. Um, so where we are. So now I have my process instance from earlier still there. And what you can all also do, by the way, um, as an operator, I can look into that process. I see, oh, it's a process it, um, with 25. And I want to maybe um, move that back to that new task because I say, okay, this should be evaluated. So I want to wanna, wanna, um, basically, yeah, just do that as an operator. I move that there and I say, start again from there. Uh, sorry? Um, for, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's something um, you know have to know what you're doing. What you could do um, in the same thing, um, you could add variables. They're plain variables. You can even do that here. Um, so if you say I, I, I jump back and forth and I need new variables, you just add them. Um, most of the customers are not doing that by clicking in cockpit but they're doing that by, um, by, by um, automating that via scripting. So you can do the same thing via Java API or REST API. You can even do that version migration. You can click that migration plan in cockpit and then you download it as a, as a JSON file and then you can apply it via API. And in the same step, normally the people are adding the, vari the variables they are missing then. But that might be very easy or very complex depending on the changes you have. We recently had a customer who um, even um, hook that in the continuous integration so they don't allow two versions to run in parallel. So every any time they deploy a new version, they do an automated upgrade and they test that beforehand, completely automated. So you can do very sophisticated things there. Um, okay, great. We had a problem with the process instance. Let's check that. So um, I already um, removed the error message, but um, there was an error, so I most probably did something wrong in the configuration, which I think um, I did. Um, in order to find that, um, what, I, what we normally do is we write unit tests. So um, what you can do um, very easily is you can write a unit test for the whole thing. And in this case, I did that. It's a JUnit test. Um, I prepared that one, actually, to be honest. So what it does, um, it basically deploys for one unit test the um, BPMN process and that Nice little diagram three DMN. Deploys in, on an in-memory engine. And then I create the variables like the input. Um, and then um, we have something um, um, with Mokito, which we call process scenarios. So we say basically when that process arrives at that user task, um, then the task should be completed in this case with um, approved equals false, for example. And we, we think that it's assigned to Mike. And then we can run that scenario and afterwards we can assert that certain things has, have happened in that process run. So that's a very cool thing actually to, to get that going. And I assert that the process has not passed um, this service task, which at least I should use that name, otherwise it will not work. And now we can run that test case and we see um, um, what error we get because I think we get an error because I did something wrong. There it is. So we have something resulting. Okay, I did configure the um, result wrong. So it's not single entry, it's single result. My, my bad. I could explain you why, but I saved the time actually. If you're interested in that, um, let me know afterwards. Um, but I can run the test again, it's green, so that's great. So you see it's very little turnaround to actually to fixed errors. Um, we have a lot of things also in the uh, test thing. So for example, we can generate test coverage, which is pretty cool. So um, for example, we um, open it in browser, wait a second. Um, we use again that what we have as a modeler just to display the process again and we read from the history where we walk through. So you can see the coverage if you have all the, process, uh, all the activities are tested in some tests or for one special test, you can see basically the path through the process model, which very often helps in order to see um, what's going wrong. So there are a couple of things you can um, do pretty well. So we deploy that again. Last thing I do, um, so I deployed. Hang on a second. So again, we can um, take that process instance. Um, we migrate it to the newest version because there we fixed that bug. 
Uh, we migrate it, so we're done. Uh, now I have the process instance in the new version. I go to the instance. I want to do the same thing. I put it there. I apply. And now it should move on. And it actually does. It ends up here again. That's not a big surprise, actually. But um, we can have a look why. So you can see um, all the audit information, like when did we walk through which um, um, activity. And you can also, for example, for DMN, you can see the executed um, um, decision table. So we, we can see, ah, this was the exact one execution of that table. We saw, ah, the car as a Porsche, he's 25. So exactly this line um, applied. So um, in the end, it will be Mike. And this is the result. So there are a couple of things you can do there. Um, there's much more in Cockpit, but I will not go into details right now. They're, they're, I think I already showed the catchy features on the, on the slides, like having this heat map, or you can um, basically get some KPIs out of it, or um, a couple of things there. So any very urgent questions? No. Nope. It's past 5 o'clock, right? Um, so let me add two more things there. Um, so what we saw so far is BPMN and we saw DMN. There's a third standard I announced earlier, which is called CMMN for case management. What's that? And if you think about that decide, uh, deciding about the application, um, if it's a very complicated application, maybe not car insurance, but health insurance, private health insurance, or industry insurance, you want to want to build a new factory and want to ensure that, um, that decision is not very easy. You have to do a lot of things in order to make the decision. And that might be something you want to model where you say, okay, when deciding, it might be that this guy needs additional documents, which might be a complete BPMN process to ask the customer to wait for documents and so on and so on. Or you need some um, assessment from your team leader or from a third party. So you can do that in BPMN, like for example, here I use the message event. It's non-interrupting, it's dotted, so that means not, or dashed, this is non-interrupting. It means I stay in the decide on application, but additionally, I flow there. But there's a limit what you can do there. So if you have like 20, 30, or 40 things you will want to do additionally, that doesn't work. And um, this is what CMMN basically is for. If you have this um, flexibility where the human decides what you want to do in that case, um, that CMMN is great there. So this is a case, a very simple one, where I say um, I have that decide on application um, here, and I have the same two additional tasks. They are marked with a play symbol. That means a manual activation rule, and that basically means you can think of like you have to play, you have to press play before they are activated in that case. Okay, so the decide on application will pop out on the task list, but the other not until that guy presses the play button. But then it might be on the task list of the group leader or not. And then you can even add more restrictions or conditions, like this is a so-called sentry, so that guards if that is possible or not, and that might depend on some condition on a DMN table or whatever. So you can do a lot of things there, actually. So it's very interesting um, to have these three standards. There's a... Um, a great poster we have. We have it in Dutch, actually, so um, you can, yeah, definitely grab one. Um, I have a couple of them here um, because our booth is already um, torn down, um, but you can get it here afterwards. So that's a great poster. Um, and one last thing, almost done, yeah. Um, what you could also do, what I did now with the service task, I added a Java class and I directly executed code. So that means I, I use some kind of push principle. The process instance moves somewhere, and then it actively calls a service. Um, what we added, um, I think, one and a half years ago um, is what we call the external task pattern. So that basically means you say, oh, I want to do something. We put it in a, uh, we call that topic, which is just a name. Um, and that's a real life example where we do um, video transcoding, which takes ages, like 10 hours, 20 hours, even longer sometimes. Um, so you don't want to want to have a blocking call waiting for 10 hours. So basically just put it in that queue and then you have a worker, which could be anything, an external program, just asking via REST API, hey, do you have something to do for me? I'm the transcode video guy. And then we hand out that task with some variables. And later on, um, he tells us, okay, I've done it, or there was a failure or an error or whatever. 
And that's what we call external task, and that's a pull principle. And that's actually very interesting, um, because if you look at the architectures, what we can do with workflow, mm, we see some changes. So most of the products still are using what I would call good old Java or good old Java E. Most of the customers we have and most of the projects that start currently are still doing that, which is not bad, I think. It's pretty, good, pretty okay for a lot of applications. And there you can use either the embedded engine or what I have here, the container managed engine. We are having database persistence. Um, we support all important databases out there. We can do clustering because we have all the state in the database. We can run as much engines as you want and the database can do on top of it. So we're pretty fine there. Um, but over the time, um, first of all, we are much more polyglot than we were a couple of years ago. So we are all Java here, but um, I'm also um, I'm quite regularly at .NET conferences by now because they don't have any engine there. There's no .NET BPMN engine. So um, it's quite natural to also use that in these environments, but they don't want to have a Java delegate written in Java. So they basically just query the REST API. Um, we also have more and more microservice um, architectures where we have a lot of um, services maybe um, uh, orchestrated together and that makes much more sense that they query their work than we want to call them actively. Um, also, they might be polyglot, so that comes in some kind of combination. Um, we also have some solutions for um, distributing, like having the workflow or having workflows in different microservices. So you can, for example, very easy fire up an own engine in separate microservices. Um, and there's something where we're currently heading at. Um, if you look at reactive things, if you look at event stream processing, um, if you look at really horizontal scalability, worldwide things, there are a lot of things um, you should consider. And we're currently um, having a quite yeah, I wouldn't call it prototype anymore. So we, we're coding um, uh, for the last two years, basically we're coding already in that direction that we have something which is based on event sourcing, which can do true horizontal scalability, which can be very reactive in that sense. So um, it, you could very easily run such a thing as a cloud service on premise or not. Um, so there are a couple of things coming up in workflow, which I think are very, very interesting. And the cool thing about that is that we will totally address new use cases with workflow. And that's an interesting message as well. So far, I talked to a lot of people out there which say, um, OK, that could be an interesting use case for workflow, but workflow is quite too slow. Can I do that? For this, for example, we are talking to a telecommunication provider. And there, the use case is not about new DSL applications, but about um, checking some stuff when you do a call, every call, because then you check, do you have like uh, money tapped on, is roaming allowed or whatever. There are a couple of checks they do and they want to have the visibility of BPMN there, but you cannot do that with traditional workflow because then it's near real, life, uh, real time. It's, it's really a huge amount of load you put onto there. And it's not impossible to, to do that with workflow and that that's, will be pretty interesting actually what we do there. Yeah, to wrap it up, um, uh, yeah, we have a lot of customers already, so that's pretty good. We're, um, yeah, you can check them yourself, actually. Go to camunda.com. We have all the references online. We have a lot of case studies online, which might be interesting as well. So if you look at uh, customers from your um, industry or um, also from the Netherlands, we have a couple of things online, so just check them. If you want to get started, just um, go to kamuna.org. That's the open source project. Everything is Apache license. You can just get started. Um, you can also get the enterprise trial. So in the enterprise version, we have a couple of additional features. We have um, all the patch levels and a couple of more things. You can find that on kamuna.com as well. Um, yeah, and I think from there you will find your way. If not, um, it's always okay to, um, to send me an email, to Twitter me or some, whatever you want to do. I think you will make your way if you have any questions. So the takeaway is use a dedicated workflow engine. If you have workflows, sounds simple, but I don't see that this often. The trio of standards, all of BPM, CMM, DMN, all standards, all ISOs, uh, no, BPM is an ISO standard. Um, all of them are OMG standards, so they are pretty interesting. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun actually to do, so um, why not doing that? Um, yeah, that's it basically for me. I'm quite in time with the delay of the start. Um, 
I was told I don't have to finish right away, so we can do questions if you have. What if you want to connect to uh, a web service, for example? Is mm -hmm. it possible? So the question was, um, what if we want to connect to a web service? And there are two possibilities um, to do that. So um, the first is um, whenever you have a, this service task, you can have like um, what we call a connector. So we have a couple of connectors prepared. One is SOAP, and then you can have a SOAP connector and you prepare basically the SOAP message and then it goes over the SOAP connector. Um, that's one possibility. Um, another possibility is like you're adding a Java class and there you just using Java in order to call the SOAP web service. Um, what we provide for our customers as well um, is um, our um, best practices. And there, for example, um, we have all these, that might be interesting as well. Oh, clicked on the wrong link, sorry. Um, um, there we discussed these kind of things. So um, the, the whole platform is pretty flexible. So it's always the interesting thing is what is the right decision this way or that way. And there it's pretty clear. So we basically advise to generate Java web service clients somehow if you're a Java shop because then you can do testing easier. If the, if the, um, w, the whistle changes, um, it's easier to adapt. So there are a lot of advantages of doing that, so. Um, but if you're not a Java shop, or if you want to deploy a BPMN XML only, not Java code additionally, then the connector might be a good choice. More questions? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and we have never got around to agreeing on that. Uh, do you have anything to say? How you should cope with those? Okay, so the question was um, Cockpit is great, but um, it might pose some security questions because you can change a lot, you can, can do a lot of um, even weird stuff. So, yeah, basically, the answer normally is. Um, that we can um, define authorizations on a very fine-grained level, so you can uh, go down to all the resources we know. So you could say, okay, there's a group which might only um, be able to read any, everything in cockpit, maybe only for one process definition, other group for another, um, and only a few people are allowed to write. Um, so normally we go into that direction, and then it means you have really a, like an administrator um, the really good guy who's able to, to write something and not a lot of people are allowed to because, yeah, you can break a lot of things there, that's true. Yeah, yeah it's also, uh, in this place it was also that even administrators were not allowed to make changes by themselves. They ah, yeah, you write a gyra ticket, ticket in order to somebody else to make yeah, a change. Yeah, change should be approved by peers. Yeah, 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 okay. Would that be something that, that's possible within this? Would, would you have to write your own? Mm. So the question was, um, is it possible to somehow uh, make it that a peer has to review your change and then to, in order to get live? So it's nothing we have as a built-in feature. But what you could do is um, you could implement it as a BPMN process, if you like. You just have to make up something how you um, make the command as, as a kind of a variable, approve it, and later on it's executed by the engine itself. You could leverage the authorization mechanism in order to get that right and in order to um, that the second guy doing the review is somebody else than you. Um, so there are things, I think you can get that running, but it's nothing um, delivered out of the box. Okay, thank you guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you.